In this video, we're going to talk about the Russian design block cipher Magma. Magma is a 64 bit block cipher that uses a 256 bit key and follows the general Feisto block cipher construction. So here's a Wikipedia page talking about this block cipher. I think this cipher was designed in the Soviet times and it was an analog of DES, the data encryption standard. I don't know a lot about the history about it, but the modern name is Magma and the specification can be found in this reference right here. And this will be the main document that we're going to work from. So our goal in this video is just to implement this block cipher. This document actually specifies two different block ciphers. We can see that in the section three here. Section three mentions how we have a 128 bit block cipher, which is called Kuzniachik. And then we also have a 64 bit block cipher called Magma. And both of them use 256 bit keys. So section four is talking about Kuzniachik. And section five is the one we want to look at for this video, which is Magma. So to start off programming this, we are given eight S boxes. And each of these S boxes are four bit S boxes. So they take in values from 0 to 15, and they give back values from 0 to 15. So why don't we just uh, copy those in place as follows. So why don't we call these pi 0 to pi 7, and then just define a variable pi to contain all of those lists. And our first thing we would like to do is to implement this function t. We see that this function t takes in 32-bit values and returns a 32-bit value. And the way it works is when we have a 32-bit value, we imagine dividing it into eight pieces of four bits each. Four times eight is 32, right? And then each of those four-bit values gets put into our eight S boxes. And then we reconcatenate all those, and that produces the value of t. So that's not too hard to implement. We can do something like this. So here's our function t. The input is 32 bits. We're going to cycle over this for loop eight times. And each time we're going to access four bits of x. We do that by shifting x to the right by an appropriate amount. Notice we started, we're doing a reverse loop here, so we're going from 7 down to 0. The very first time on this loop, when i is 7, we shift x to the right by 28 spots. And then we end it with four ones to grab the most significant four bits. And from those bits, we get the index j. The index i is for the s boxes to be used, whether it's pi 0 up to pi 7. And then the index j is the um, value that we're putting into the s box. Notice how y is initialized to zero there. And then each time through the loop, we're adding on something to y, which is the current value of the s box. And then we shift all the bits on y over by four to make room for the next piece that's added onto y. And we could actually test this. They give us some test values here for the function t just to make sure it's working. You can find those here. All right, so here's a test value we can try. Let's take in this input and we'll put it into T and see if we get the proper output. So let's define X to be that value. And when we run it, we get uh, this value here, 2A1, and then it ends in an F34. Yeah, that's, that's equal to that. So it looks like T is working. Let's keep going. Now, if we notice that in the specification here, we're going to be performing a 
bit rotation by 11, a left bit rotation by 11 on 32 bit integers. So let's just implement that. So for that, let's just introduce one more constant here called mask 32. And that'll just be two to the power of 32 minus one. And what that really is, is 32 bits, which are all ones, and then zeros after that. And this way, if we ever want to grab 32 bits of an integer, we can just add it with mask 32, and, and that'll do the job. So the next little function to achieve this rotation is this one. Let's just call this rotation 11, rot 11. It takes in a 32-bit integer. It shifts everything over by 11. By doing that, we've gone past 32 bits, and that's the reason we need to end it with mask 32. And the bits that went over the edge are actually these bits right here. And then we move them over to the right end, and then we glue them together using the end. So that's not too hard to see how that works. Now, the next thing to do is to implement the function lowercase g, which takes in a key and an input value. So, now what does it do? It looks kind of complicated, but really all that's going on here is we're adding a and k, just using normal integer addition, but it's modded by 2 to the power of 32. And then we put that into t, and then we rotate it by 11. So that's all the lowercase function g is, okay? x plus k, you do that normal addition. This is not xor here. This is just normal integer addition. But then we mod it by 2 to the 32. I guess I could write mask 32 plus 1, but I don't find that very readable. So that, um, and then whatever that value is, which is now a 32-bit value, we put it into t. This is actually the Feistel function of this cipher. This block cipher is a Feistel cipher. And every Feistel cipher has a Feistel function. And this is the Feistel function for this Feistel cipher. We'll see that construction later of how it behaves very similar to DES because DES is also a Feistel cipher. They're both based on the same general construction. All right, so that takes care of our function lowercase g. And we need to just introduce two little helper functions here. This cipher is a 64-bit block cipher, and since the cipher is based on the Feistel construction, that means we're going to be working with the left half and the right half. So we need a little function to split a 64-bit input value into two 32-bit uh, parts, the left half and the right half. And that's what this little function accomplishes. If we're given a 64-bit input, the left half is just you take X and shift it to the right. That knocks off all the 32 bits on the right, and it just preserves the leftmost significant 32 bits. And to grab the right half, 32 bits, we just take X and add it with our mask. And then we return L and R as a tuple. And then opposite to splitting a 64-bit value into two 32-bit values, we also need a, a little function to join two given 32-bit values, L and R, and then join them together to make a 64-bit value, where the L goes on the left and the R goes on the right. So that's easy to do. We just take L, shift it over by 32 spots. That leaves 32 zeros available for the places of R, and then we glue them together using the XOR. And we'll see how those little helper functions come up. Now, the next thing we have to do is the key schedule, which is right here. Now, like I said, uh, this key for this cipher is a 256-bit key. Now, that's something that's very different than DES, right? DES only is a 56-bit key, and that's why DES is weak. But this is a 256-bit key, so we're more likely to have a secure cipher here than over DES. So, Notice that the first eight keys are actually all coming from the original 256-bit key. If we have a 256-bit key, 
We can imagine that as eight keys of 32 bits each. And that's what we're going to do here. And then the rest of the keys are just repeats of that. The next eight keys are just those original eight keys. And then the next eight keys are again uh, a repeat of those eight keys. And then the last eight keys are also those keys, but they're in the reverse order. So we have K1 through K8, and then K1 through K8, and then K1 through K8, and then K8 through K1. So even though this key schedule produces 32 keys, we really only have eight unique keys in, in this list. So here's some code we can do that with. So we have a input of a 256 bit key. That's our input to our key schedule. And we're going to return a list of 32 keys. That's going to be held in this variable, which is initialized to an empty list at the beginning. And each of those uh, keys will have 32 bits. Now, the first eight keys, like we talked about, just come from K. And those are grabbed right here. We just shift K over by an appropriate amount. And then we end it with this mask 32, and that grabs the 32 bits we're interested in. And then we add that to our key list. And that forms the first eight keys. And then the next eight keys are just duplicates of that original eight. And then same thing again, the next eight are just duplicates of the original eight. And then the final eight keys are the reverse of those original eight. Now I, I could probably write this a little bit more fancy, but I find that readable enough like it is. It is a little bit wasteful to just store all these extra keys, even though they're duplicates. Really, we could just store these eight keys right here. And then later in the code, we could make up for it. But to make the code as simple as possible to read, let's just define all these keys like this. So that completes the key schedule. And now we're actually ready for the encryption function, which is right here. So the function G, I didn't define that yet, but notice G here plays the role in the encryption function. And then we have the function G star on the end. Notice how each time we're using uh, one of our 32 keys that come from the key schedule. So we take 256 bit key, we put it in the key schedule, that gives us 32 keys, and then we run our original input through the our function G 32 times. Notice how the input value A here, which is 64 bits, is broken up into two pieces, each being 32 bits. And that's why we needed that split function, right? And now that function capital G is right here. And this is just the basic construction how the Feistel construction works, right? You take your Feistel function, you apply it to the key and the right half, and then you XOR it with the left half. And I'm not going to code the function G explicitly. I'm just going to write this as one line inside of our encrypt function. So there's no real need to write the function G and G star separately. So let's see how that goes. Our encryption function for magma will look like this. So here we go. This is how we encrypt using the magma block cipher. Our input is 64 bits. This is a 64 bit block cipher. Our key here is 256 bits. The first thing we do is we call our key schedule. And then we have a list of 32 keys. There's really only eight of them that are original though. And then the L and the R come from splitting the 64-bit input, the plain text, into two 32-bit pieces. And then this block cipher takes in 32 rounds. Here are the first 31 rounds. And then the last round is just to do one more of these XORing with the Feistel function. But notice in the last round, we don't, we don't interchange them, right? We keep the rightmost 32 bits on the right. Whereas every other one of the 31 rounds, we swap them. This is just a basic Feistel construction. This is not particular to Magma. This technique is the same as Des. This is the basic construction of a Feistel block cipher. Except Des only uses 16 rounds, whereas this uses 32 rounds. And Des only has a 56-bit key, 
whereas this has a 256-bit key. And now we can test our encryption function here. They do give us some test values. I guess we should have tested our function G and our key schedule K as well before we test our encryption function. Why don't we do that? Let's test our function G. If we take in these two values to G, do we get this value here? Let's test that. Remember, this looks like an integer, but this is really a hex value, right? And we want to put these two parameters into G, and hopefully we get the expected value. So we get FDC and then a 20C at the end. There we go. So that's working. Good. Now this is testing a key schedule. So this is how a 256-bit key looks. Let's take that and we'll call that K. Let's take, let's apply our key schedule to that key. And then we'll just print off each key and make sure we're getting the keys that we're supposed to be getting. All right, so here they are. Uh, here is K1. That's matching with our K1 right here. That's good. And all the way down to K8. That's matching FC. That's right there. So those are the keys that come from the key that was given to us. Notice how here we have, if we look at this FF all the way up to the CC here, that's the first, that's the most significant 32 bits of our 256 bit key. And then the next 32 bits is right here, all the way down until the last 32 bits there. So these eight keys come directly from the 256 bit key. And then notice the rest of these columns are just duplicates of this, right? These two columns are exactly the same as that. And then this last column, is just the reverse of it. Notice how this value is down here and this value is up here, etc. So really these, the keys, uh, the only interesting keys are from K1 up to K8 and the rest are just duplicates. And so it looks like our key schedule is working, which is good. And now we're ready to test our encryption algorithm. This is the plain text. This is 64 bits. And we're gonna feed this into the encryption algorithm. And these are the results of the 32 rounds. The plain text is this given value here. And let's try to print out the ciphertext using the encryption function that we just wrote. And then we'll print it off and see if the ciphertext here is the value that is predicted. So 4EE and ending in a 3D, and we're good. 4EE ending with a 3D. All right, so it looks like our encryption function is working, and now we need a decryption function. And for a Feistel cipher, the decryption function is the same as the encryption function, except the keys are in the reversed order. So it's really the exactly the same code, except for this line right here. We just reverse the keys. Maybe one small detail I forgot to mention is that this negative one here just means the last key, right? This is the last round. This is the 32nd round. And so we're using the last key of the list on the 32nd round. So we can test if our decryption function is working just by trying to decrypt this ciphertext. So I'm going to write DT for decrypted text. And we'll call magma decrypt on that. And we'll put in our ciphertext with our key. And what we're hoping for is that the decrypted text is the same as the original plain text. So if we get a true there, then everything's working good. Yeah, we do. All right, we get a true there. That means everything's working well. And that concludes our implementation of the Magma block cipher. Thanks for watching.